Hello, welcome to a brand new podcast from Royal Central. I'm Lydia Starbuck. I'm the Associate Editor at Royal Central. And we're kicking off a new series on our podcast. It's an occasional series, but one we hope will keep you listening over the coming months. It's our best of series. We're going to be taking all kinds of royal topics, history topics, and debating which part is the best. And we're going to start with our really popular series on royalcentral.co.uk, Monarchy Rules, where we look at the kings and queens of England, Scotland and Great Britain. Our Monarchy Rules Best Of will see us examine each royal house in turn. There'll be a debate about which was the best monarch for each royal house. And you can join in our debate. You can join in on our Podbean page, over on Facebook, over on social media. We'll give you all the details of how to take part. We're kicking off with the shortest lived royal house in British history, the House of Saxe, Coburg and Gotha. It had one and a little bit monarchs. It was in existence for just 16 years and it's the focus of our first best of podcast. Let's have a chat about the monarchs involved. It's not much of a choice, really. You've got Edward VII versus George V. So this time round, we're not going to ask you which was the best monarch. We're going to ask you how well did Edward VII do? Because really, although George V was a monarch of the House of Saxe, Coburg and Gotha, it kind of all centres on Edward. Shall we have a look at the house itself? As I said, it took power in 1901 on the accession of Edward VII. Now, Edward, of course, was the son of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. And that's where the name of the house comes from. Saxe, Coburg, Gotha was Prince Albert's family house. Victoria was desperate for it to be carved into British royal history and her eldest son made her dream come true after her death, admittedly. When he became king in January of 1901, the dynasty changed from Hanover to Saxe, Coburg and Gotha. Now, Edward exceeded all expectations. Until the moment he became king, no one really knew exactly what to make of him. He'd been written off as a playboy prince, in part because his mum was so determined to keep him away from any real influence during her lifetime. And that's another interesting debate that I'm sure we'll have on Royal Central at some point, this idea of Victoria as the widow in her weeds, never really looking anyone in the eye. She was actually a very ambitious, very influential monarch. But let's talk about that another time. Let's go back to Edward. As of January 1901, he is finally king. He's waited over six decades for this moment. His house becomes the house of his father. And at that point, there's Edward in the shadow of his mother, in the shadow of his father, and no one really knows if he's going to be able to make a go of the job that he was born to do and that he has waited his whole adult life to take on. It didn't take him very long to surprise just about everybody. He had a really sound grasp of foreign policy, a very deep interest in what was going on in his country, and he quickly became popular with the public and with politicians. Of course, his private life, kept the burgeoning press more than occupied. But it's probably fair to say that his short reign, it lasted just over nine years, was a success. Edward died in May 1910 and the image of the playboy Prince of Wales had been replaced by the idea of a kind of grandfather of the nation, a statesman, somebody that people looked up to. And that kind of brings us to our first question in this best of series. How successful was Edward VII? as a monarch because actually our concept of him is really shaped by those nine years that he was on the throne you just think back you know from the moment he kind of turned about 20 in 1861 ish you know from then on he'd been a playboy he'd been known for his extramarital relations for his gallivanting around the more salacious parts of Paris shall we say and suddenly he turned into a very responsible politically minded monarch so is that enough? Are those nine years as a successful king enough to outweigh what had gone before? Go over to Facebook and have a chat with us there. We've put an article about the House of Saxe, Coburg and Gotha up on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash 
Royal Central, and we'd love to hear from you. We're not quite done with the House of Saxe, Coburg and Gotha yet. Edward died in May 1910, and he was succeeded by his second son, George, who became King George V. Now, again, George was a bit of an unknown quantity. For much of his early adult life, he'd been in the Navy. No one had expected him to become king because he had an older brother. But that older brother, Albert Victor, had died tragically at a very young age in 1892, George had been thrust into the direct line of succession and from that point onwards he had worked very hard but he was a bit dour. He was quite quiet. He liked to keep his head down. Suddenly in May 1910 he couldn't do that anymore. The eyes of the empire fell on him and a bit like his father he wasn't found wanting. His accession was widely celebrated and he did enjoy a measure of stability unknown to some of his European relatives because, of course, George became king at a time when disgruntlement with royal rule was beginning to trickle through. It was a tumultuous time in Europe. Within four years of George becoming king, his country was at war. The First World War had begun. George, along with his wife, Queen Mary was determined to show his fellow citizens that he stood alongside them. He was often seen in his military uniform. Mary, who, of course, George had married after her fiancé had died. She'd been engaged to Albert Victor. She'd been handpicked by Queen Victoria to be consort. Mary was absolutely obsessed with duty. So while George was in his uniform and showing people he stood alongside them, Mary, along with their only daughter, Princess Mary, initiated royal visits to wounded soldiers. They were instrumental to the war effort. But there was one big problem for the ruling dynasty. People liked them. They could see that they were working hard. They could see their commitment to the people. But they were called Saxe Coburg Gotha, a German name. And the enemy of Britain in the First World War was Germany. The German origins of George's family, of Mary's family, she was Mary of Tech, began to become too problematic to ignore as the conflict that we know as the First World War came to its apogee. In 1917, George took the decision to renounce all his German titles, to renounce all the German titles of his relatives and to change the name of his ruling house. It was just too German to survive. George looked around and came up with a very, very English name, because if there was one thing that George V was really good at, it was PR. And he looked around and he came up with the very English sounding Windsor. It turned out to be his most strategic and successful PR move of all. The House of saxe coburg Gotha was consigned to history in 1917. The House of Windsor took power. It's held power ever since, now 103 years into its rule. That's our look at the House of saxe coburg and Gotha, the first of our looks at the royal houses that have ruled Britain, England, Scotland, Britain, various parts of the British Isles. We'll have another one for you very soon where I'll be joined by some of my colleagues from Royal Central and we will all argue the case for a different monarch in each royal house and you can have a listen and then decide who you agree with. We hope you can join us for that then. Always lots of history over on the website royalcentral.co.uk. Thanks for listening to this podcast and we will see you very soon.